15 seconds did these people just see us mm-hmm. or not with the fade I don't know if you saw an episode yet but no not yet anyway uh, there we are we're starting podcast number four of the crunch cast uh, with our very first guest Charles Brungart Chuck Diesel if you will uh, That's right. he's actually the uh, our boss our president the lord and savior at Alphonic and I don't know why they're not working right now yeah. I guess that's this is what they do. No, <laughs> it is. It's almost midnight, so yeah, we're, we're pretty much done for the day, I guess. Well, you know. It's an early I was day. hoping, yeah, early, yeah. You know. <laughs> we're knocking off early to goof off here on the internet. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. We're worried by one today, so. And uh, I'm Brian McConnell. I'll introduce myself. So, Good job. Good yeah. introduction. <laughs> you, did, you did great. You did great. Anyway, um... So yeah, I got, I got Chuck on here as our first guest. I kind of wanted to talk to him about his what he does, what his what he's into, um, and how he found his way into games so mysteriously and quickly. Some yeah. would call it meteoric rise, yeah. owning his own company, so to speak. Yeah, you know. What is it officially? A co-owner, or just yeah. president, or something like that. Co-owner, I guess. President. And I guess the who who counts as like I guess is it you co-owning with Raphael? Yeah, there's a. Uh, yeah, pretty much, like, you know, we started it, and then Kedron came in and stuff, and is, like, one of the founders as well, and yeah. stuff like that, and, um... That's just Aerophonic itself, the video game company. Yeah, exactly, Aerophonic, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, pretty much, yeah, it's, I guess, small, independent-owned, which is good, but, you know, uh, trying to keep it that way as long as we can, and... Sure, sure. You yeah. know keep that spirit but also grow in a way to where you know i think we're doing some really cool work for the amount of people we have and the amount of budget and time and all that stuff so it's uh yeah it's working out good great great um so let's let's take a step back real quick sure um and let's talk about how you got started in um just what if you don't for the uninitiated here uh our dear friend chuck uh, is a multiple Grammy winning artist in the music industry and well, transition. <laughs> we like to say I, that. <laughs> I would say I'm a artist. I've worked on Okay, not artist. Worked on What's albums. the word you like to use? Or is it pro- like not producer but um technical uh, I, like engineer. Yeah. Um yeah, like you know, I started out He's the guy doing this behind <laughs> the glass. Start out as an assistant engineer, um, you know, an intern and then worked my way to the assistant engineer position and during that time recorded some albums that you know ended up going on to win Grammys and then right. one of them I was an engineer on as well so kind of moved into that position and then you know over time kind of moved into like a lead engineer position and started mixing is kind of like when you're engineering the goal is to you know record for a while and then mix and I guess people maybe retire mixing I don't know I mean I kind of liked it both, recording and mixing. You know, you get to a certain age, you just want to mix because you can do an eight-hour eight, eight hour day, go home and get paid, like, a ridiculous amount. But, you know, the industry kind of took a shit, and, um, yeah, I don't know. I figured, like, I always was in the games. I was kind of always my goal was to, to do games, to do my own company. Um, I eventually worked my way up to producer and co-produced Raphael's last album, and that yeah. was kind of a big goal of mine. And just for anybody to know, that's, if you don't know, that's referring to uh, Raphael Sadiq. Yeah. If, if you don't know who he is, you're probably like a lot of people that don't follow anything. <laughs> uh, he's been on episodes of Conan O'Brien, he's put out album after album. Uh, what was... Should we bring up the Tony thing? Or is that okay? yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in Tony, Tony, Tone? Tony, right? Tony, Tony. Yeah, Tony, Tony, Tony. Yeah, but it was and all spelled up, different. So. Yeah, they were all spelled different ways of saying And if you were... You know, if you grew up in the, it was the the nineties when they were doing their main hits, right? Yeah. yeah. If, if if you listen to music, then you 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 know who we're talking about. Yeah, definitely. And he was the lead singer, and then started his own production career mm-hmm. after they were done. And uh, and he's not just like some rap guy. He can play all his instruments and makes all his own music. And yeah, like I said, if you've seen him on Conan O'Brien or any other performances beyond those, um, you know he's he is quite an entertainer. He sings, plays his instruments. Uh, who, what was it? He did the bit off a. Uh, with Mick Jagger, right? Yeah. Uh, what, what was, was that on? It was some award show. What, what award show was oh, that? Oh, that was the Grammys. The Grammy Award. This, yeah. this, this last year, the Grammys, it was uh, Raphael Sadiq and Mick yeah. Jagger performing. So there you go. Yeah, no, it was cool. Like, uh, it's definitely been an awesome experience because it was kind of like, I guess, you know, ever since I was little, I probably wanted to be 
Like, first was, like, a helicopter pilot. You should, not Batman? <laughs> not Bat. Well, you know, I mean, if, <laughs> if I could be Batman, that'd be awesome. But, uh, yeah, it was, like, helicopter pilot. Then I'm like, okay, you know, that'd be a sweet job. But it's, you know, the older you get, I guess, I wasn't as cool with heights, maybe. But oh, sure. No. That's scary. I mean, I'm sure if you wanted to be a pilot, you rode in one before. Mm. I don't think so, actually. You haven't been in a helicopter? No. That's uh, so crazy, because when they turn... You know, it's not like a car. The wheels turn, and it turns the whole the whole vehicle itself. Has, has what is the pitch and the yaw? Yeah. So when you're doing a turn, the helicopter is sideways, and you're like, "Oh dear, the whole <laughs> the whole door over here is uh, pretty much glass. <laughs> you can see all the ground. It's awesome. That's but cool. It's a little scary the first time, like a roller coaster. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'll have to try it. I've always wanted to, and yeah. So then I guess after that, it was like I always wanted to make video games. I got my parents bought me an NES when I was like four four and a half you know i remember uh i got it for a gift um oh yeah i remember getting my nintendo yeah it was probably one of the most memorable which is kind of crazy most memorable moments of my childhood me too oh, man yeah you know my so. dad tried to hide it he <laughs> he got the nintendo box and he put two by fours around it and like stuffed a bigger box inside it and i was like this is a nintendo with wood around it <laughs> he was like <sighs> Wow, that was pretty smart. But that was... It, it, kids always figure that stuff out. They know. Yeah. Somehow know. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was it was one of those days, and I just remember, like, I got the one with the robot, which was pretty cool, but the robot was kind of... I don't know, it was cool to have. Oh, the Rob, cool. yeah. Yeah, the it Rob. It was basically like one game, and it did nothing. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. neat to play with, though. I remember my dad, the first day we got it, he hooked it up and played, like, Duck Hunt to, like, level 50-something, and yeah. I just sat there and watched him and was so, like... I was so amazed, but by the time he got to level 10, I just wanted to play. So Let me play. <laughs> yeah, but he had fun. And that was the one game that transcended. Like, my dad, even my grandpa, was, like, rocking duck hunt yeah. when we first got I it. I think mine was, too. And the crazy thing is, is that was early video games, that then you put a controller in their hand, and mm -hmm. they couldn't do it. So, yeah, I mean, maybe I guess it's hope that Connect and we well, that's, will that's bring our really, generations. Uh, if, if people don't get it, I mean, yeah. If you don't, if you, if you haven't got it by now, uh, video games, everything about them is based on their controller. Yeah. Like if you take a game, like a, we're making a first-person shooter Nexus for the Xbox 360, PS3, and PC coming yeah. sometime. <laughs> sometime um, in the near future, yeah. who does win? Yeah. The the one of the biggest uh, reasons that FPS has failed on consoles for so long, but thrived on PC was the controls. Yeah, and no one was able to translate those controls the right way and now they've done it now and it's been great it's perfect but it took a long time for them to figure out the right controller to even play that type of game so like if you play a classic NES game like if you have it like on one of your iPads or something with the touch some of them are just unplayable oh yeah and it's just the controller it's, it has nothing to do with the gameplay type it's all down to the controls yeah that's why I mean I don't know mobile games are cool but I just kind of had a hard time with them just you know I guess Angry Birds is fun but oh yeah, yeah. There's pretty much two game styles, either flinging something or swiping something. Yeah, it's all about um, like the Angry Birds or the, or the Fruit Ninja. It, yeah. As long as you have those basic control types that people have figured out work well, and if you could advance something beyond that. Probably the best game i played recently for iPhone that I'm really impressed with is Trials, the motorcycle game. Oh yeah, I've seen that. I you know, played. like I hate the gyroscope-based games, but it's the only gyroscope game that's fun because you're moving it at a lot slower of a speed rather than... You know, like those other games, like car games, you're, you're trying quickly, to like, yeah, you're yeah, trying to make it quick. They need, they, they they need to make it easy, as long as it's like it's, it's the intuitive control. Yeah. But, but anyway, you were talking about you got your Nintendo for Christmas, and everybody loved Duck Hunt. Yeah, <laughs> and then after that, I always wanted to make games. And I remember when I was a little kid, I had this experience. Uh, I I used to be on a ski team when I was younger, so I'd go up every weekend. I think Chuck used to be a bad mf'er if you don't think he's one today. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I used to used to be a pretty big skier and did that for a while and I remember when I was probably in uh, like maybe fourth or fifth grade one of our coaches actually had a uh, worked at a game studio they're working on like a Barbie game for Sega Genesis and I just somebody remember, had to make yeah one. I just remember going into this office that was kind of you know it was pretty small probably the size of our first actual office not the studio apartment it uh oh, the one in uh, ninth and yeah Lincoln yeah it was a little bit smaller than that and it was like four or five guys and which was awesome back then that it, that was it and I just remember seeing assembly for the first time assembler code on the screen and ever since then I was like I didn't really look back you know I mean sure then sixth grade I got a guitar and uh, got kind of caught up with that end of things and decided that 
you know, I actually in college tried my hand at doing the dot We did programming stuff. in college, so I mean, you have a, you had a programming background. Yeah, I actually started programming in sixth grade, and then, um, like, I think it took a year or two after seeing that game studio, I finally went and took uh, some college courses, and when I was in sixth grade, learning assembly, and did pretty well in it, and just kind of kept going. In high school, I took pretty much my first year of computer science, I knocked it out from uh, a junior college, and, you know, then went... To went and interned every summer at a company making software. Did you, so go, to, did you go to school in San Francisco? Or? Yeah, University of San Francisco. I remember, uh, uh, we've been out there a few times for like GDC, and, and when we go up there with Chuck, Chuck knows everywhere to go. Yeah. He's, like, he's like pointing out this this Vietnamese restaurant the, with the, that seven courses. Oh, we yeah. go there every time. He's like, look, gotta know these spots. He, he can take you out to these spots you've never heard of. It's kind of scary because everyone knows me too. So yeah, and you go in there, the people remember Chuck. It's yeah. yeah, that's great though. They just know like that's the guy that likes to eat. So, <laughs> yeah. Eats that, all that's, the food and comes that kind out. of information is the best kind of information for you know, really being a good entertainer and host to people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's tough because I think I know good spots in Denver now, but I don't know San Francisco. It's kind of it. it you know, there's something you special about that. There. Yeah, you blossomed there, but since yeah. you've been here, you know, you've been working hard. Yeah, exactly. It's a different, it's a different atmosphere, a different, yeah. different time in your life. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, like when I was in college, I I, I interned at a company um, for this guy actually, Sam Norling, and a couple companies he worked at. Then he started his own, and it was just awesome. He's a great mentor. But um, ultimately, I just got learned, you know, computer science at school and doing, you know, the startup thing and just kind of. I got tired of web development, and then I got tired of like what Making we're websites learning. And stuff. Yeah. yeah, well, it was it was a little cooler than that. Like it was, you know, we're doing some cool shit, I guess. But well, no, you're not just like making websites for the regular Joe. You're probably like yeah. talking about doing uh, more like databases and setting up. Yeah, exactly. Like websites, like e-commerce. Websites like, back in the day were just a site. Yeah. But websites today are an application exactly. that you log on to and yeah. that kind of stuff. So yeah, and there were applications advanced. and stuff, but I just got tired of working with databases and stuff. I always wanted to get into games, but unfortunately... Sure. It's monotonous. It's, there, there is a lack of creativity there, and I can understand yeah, that. Yeah. The school I went to was very, like, research-heavy into Linux, and, like, you know, a lot of the stuff they were teaching you would go well if you were to work at Lawrence Livermore Labs, but that wasn't... I wanted to either make games or... You know, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do in software. I wanted to start a company, but games was something I never really gave up on I just felt that I could never do it sure. you know what I mean like I felt well, oh uh, well. what uh, do you just particularly remember what year you graduated high school uh, 2000 2000 yeah so that was still that was still a really limiting time as far as school was yeah. concerned for video game development so it's it was very difficult for someone to say yeah you can do this I mean, yeah it, it, it was more like the later 2000 where a lot of schools started jumping in on it and making these programs. Definitely. And then it was a few more years after that before those programs were actually worth a crap. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, there's been a lot of, like, there's a lot of pretty good schools, it looks like, now. Yeah, I mean, but nowadays, you know, all these guys are coming up from, like, wherever, full sale. Yeah, yeah, I know so many guys from full sale now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's because one guy gets into the company, and then, boom, he brings all his buddies up. And they're, they're, they're nothing wrong. They're all pretty good guys. <laughs> yeah. It's a good school, uh, and, like, Guildhall, and all these others that, like I said, they just didn't exist back then. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, unfortunately, my school, you know, we had some guys do pretty much every year for senior project. One or two groups would want to do a game, and they eventually, you know, my freshman year, there was like three groups that That's did difficult. it. All the games are crap. Sure. You know, just terrible, top down, just, I don't know, I mean, I've seen young kids make better games than what was made at our school, unfortunately, and I don't mean to slam them, but they kind of put a stop to people making games because they were so bad, so eventually they limited it to one group, and then the year that I was there, um, you know, for my senior team project, they wouldn't let us do a game at all, so, you know, I wanted to do a set-top because, box. Was that because of all the other students that just, they just crapped out all these crappy ones? So yeah. They just took it. Yeah. Yeah, that sucks when... Hey, one guy ruins it all. Yeah, yeah I mean, we didn't, uh, you know, we, we didn't really have it. a graphic If the art curriculum's department. not really there, it's difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I could have found a 3D modeler to save my life at oh, at sure, USF, sure. you know? Like, it just, and I wasn't really in, I was at that time probably more into, like, using the internet as a resource to learn how to make music, which even then it was, it was just limited. Yeah, it was very limited, limited I mean, info. Like I said, it was cool, and there's a lot of good people out there, but things that these days, 
Yeah, nowadays it's you got UDK and oh, for games. Yeah, games. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah it's there's, there's all sorts of things out there. Yeah, no, yeah. nothing to me. I don't. I want to say it's, nothing's more upsetting because there's a lot more things that are more upsetting. Trust me, but uh, <laughs> it, it is upsetting when you see people post or ask questions like, "Oh, well, I need a tutorial to know how to do this." There's not. There's not enough. Co- there's not enough comprehensive tutorials on how to paint foliage. There's something, just some asinine comment. Yeah. Like, just look. Yeah. And whatever anybody's saying, learn from it. And if you don't see what you're looking for, learn it yourself, like all the rest of us. Yeah. The, there, was, there wasn't anything for games in 1996. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, even when I kind of got into it, too, I mean, there was, like, there was Unreal Tournament 3 mod help, but it still was very limited. It still isn't what it is now. Oh, now. You know, so there was still a lot of, like, trying to figure it out, banging your head, trying to find examples. But, you know, I mean, pretty much it just got to a point where, you know, after college, I ended up pretty much halfway through college, I decided I didn't want to really program anymore. I wanted to get into music, and I tried starting a record label and did all that and worked with artists. and at All that, these hip-hop guys, you know, yeah. oh, look, I got... Put down some beats. Mm-hmm. Give me some beats. I got, I got, I got some rhymes. Let me throw it down. Yeah, exactly. I heard you got a studio. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you know, I tried, I tried to figure out how I'd make a living doing that, and it, I don't know, it worked out, but it ultimately, or I met, which was really cool. I met this producer that was working with uh, Raphael, which was uh, yeah. How, how did you um, if, if it doesn't break your timeline here, your story, how, no, how did you initially get uh, involved with Raphael? Um, Pretty much when I was working in college with that, I worked at a studio in San Francisco called Molten Studios. It was primarily house music, and there was this artist that, um, you know, our, uh, the guy that, like, ran the place that I interned for, um, JJ, actually, he was working with this artist, and the artist uh, um, had a brother that wanted to kind of work and break into the industry, and he already kind of had, his sister had ground, like, she was signed to Def Jam at one point, and then he... Uh, was kind of coming up it was the next one in their family to really do the thing and you know we worked really hard at it and made an album and from there we you know when we're making that album we met some producers through JJ who I interned for that um, and those two producers Jake and the fat man this guy named Glenn and Bobby they were a production team out of Oakland I just think of the old detective show that's kind of what it was except they spelled it with like fat P-H-A-T instead of you know the fat man but uh, P-H for fat (laughs) that that way the hip hop people like it which was kind of funny because there was a guy about my size and then there's another guy that was like super skinny uh Bobby was like super skinny and small but he was the beat maker so he was blowing up records his hobby yeah so (laughs) so uh (laughs) he got the reference yeah yeah, so his his whole thing was um, he was the fat man, even though he was the little guy, but everyone thought the big guy was yeah. the fat man. Yeah, like know? we call you tiny. Exactly. Hey, yeah. Slim. Yeah, exactly. Slim. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyways, yeah, it was, you know, those guys ended up working with this artist as well, helping us on the album, and, um, you know, we're trying, they eventually brought me down to L.A. to kind of work with them and Raphael, and then we started, uh, you know, I started working with Raphael, and then... Um, from there just kind of worked my way up so that was kind of the initial introduction um, and then you know from there there was I was there for about three or four years and we're working about three years working pretty hard we uh, just did a pretty big album so you know I had a little bit of extra cash at the time and figured like I would throw it in and uh, same with Raphael we would just he came up with this idea for ghetto golf kind of as a joke um i don't know if you remember the def jam vendetta games oh god yeah kind of as a joke kind of as a joke yeah i remember them yeah i mean i guess like, no, they're all right i know yeah. some guys that worked on them and stuff so. yeah i mean i guess like you know whatever it wasn't really my thing like who really wants to play rappers fighting each other in a fight game but i mean yeah. besides yeah. shaquille o'neal yeah exactly but i mean there was a lot of people kind of that whole like urban hip-hop community really embrace that game. Yeah, it almost seems like it would make sense to make that game. Yeah. It almost seems like it. And I think the first one did pretty... I mean, they did, like... The first couple did a million, or... That'd be bad. It can't, yeah, it can't take anything away from that. Even Icon, I mean, they spent a lot of money, but I think it did, like, right under a million, you know, which... I don't know, shit, if we hit a million on awesome. any game we made... Well, for us, it'd be another book <laughs> where they're like, they're, like, paying for likeness yeah. and songs all these people so I'm yeah. sure that for them 
that kind of number is like death. Oh yeah, the not, budgets were not huge, death as know? in Death Jam, death as in D E A T H. <laughs> yeah, Grim Reaper. Yeah, so um, at that time, his uh, actually his, one of his good friends was like the executive producer on the Death Jam side of the game, and um, you know he used to always ask her, he would always want to be in the game and she's like, oh, well, we don't have R&B artists in the game, we only have, uh, you know, rappers and you'll never be in this game and Raphael's kind of like, oh, well, I'm going to make my own game and he said that as a joke but I, like, was sitting right there when he was on the phone I'm like, dude, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, so, um... Is he going to be in the Gotta Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if he'll... He'll probably be a character somewhere, I'm sure. Look, you'll, go into so. a, you'll, you'll go into a concert and he'll be performing. Yeah, exactly. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't know. I mean, I think like we haven't really so much found a place for him yet because I He'll think play there's the role so many as God, characters. The narrator. <laughs> yeah, totally. But <laughs> Dante, um, through his journey. Yeah, but yeah, no. I mean, that's what's crazy is like, yeah. So he came back, and I just remember he like walked into the bathroom, and like a minute later came out and was like, "Oh, I got a game idea. It's called Ghetto Golf." And I'm like, "Dude, that's awesome!" and the more I thought about it, I researched it, made sure no one did anything like that, and thought about it hard, and I'm like, this could be awesome, you know, like, it has a lot of potential to be good, and yeah. that's kind of when we started jumping on it, because I told him I could do it, and I showed him some ideas, and, you know, I found some freelance guys to do some assets on the cheap, and then, you know, he helped me with a lot of things, like, kicked in some money, and helped with kind of the space we're at, stuff like that, and, you know, had me set up an office in his studio, and it just kind of started from there. We did about six to eight months of freelance, and then met Cole, which uh, Cole Egan. Cole Egan, which that's is what that's what the guys in Wolfenstein say when they die. They say, <laughs> <Yeah>. Cole Egan. <laughs> That'd be funny as a if you put that in there as a as an Easter egg. <laughs> you know, I think our Easter egg will. Let's see. I don't know. I'm thinking, you know, if you die, we could be like something. I don't know. That that is a good suggestion. So, yeah, it's, yeah it's I, I brought blanks. that up. Sorry, it's we really don't want to tell them anyways. Yeah. It's really important <laughs> that you brought that up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Keep that. At, we'll keep that Easter egg a secret. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a yeah. Let's we'll we'll talk about uh, uh some of the crazy things we've done as far as uh being a part of Elphonic and whatnot. But um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, you feel like telling some stories from the uh, music industry things. You don't have to, you know, name drop, but yeah, you could tell, you know, anything about anything crazy that went down, stuff you saw, places you got to go, people you got to meet. Yeah, definitely. Feel free about uh, anything like that because I know about the. Now you guys recorded an album. Yeah. In the Bahamas or something. something yeah, we're like in that. the Bahamas at uh, Chris Blackwell's um, studio. Let's see, it was, uh, you know, the guy that started Island Def Jam, and uh, basically. Got a chance to go down there and record Joss Stone's album, so that was pretty fun. I mean, pretty much like a giant party the whole time. Well, I wouldn't say that. We worked really hard, but basically just... Well, I wouldn't even say it was a really giant party. It was more just like a giant vacation. Yeah. Because you'd work 12-hour days, but it's a little bit different when you'd work like 3 in the afternoon and 3 in the morning. You'd get up around 10, and then, you know, by 11, you're already done eating breakfast, heading towards the beach or something. So you get a good three or four hours in every day of, like, beach lounge time. Sometimes we'd do, you know, rent jet skis. Sometimes we would, you know, go go to the beach and come in a little bit late or something. And then, uh, you know, make it up later, kind of work later hours. And then every Sunday we had off, which was great. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It was like a vacation. but That's pretty awesome. Yeah. A lot yeah. of different experiences, I guess, there. That's kind of how we explained PAX is... Like, PAX was awesome to go to, but it was more of, like, a... It, it was less of a vacation and more work-oriented. Yeah. Like, it was about 90% work and 10% vacation. We'd, we'd work all day, party all night, and get, like, four to six hours of sleep. Yeah, it'd just <laughs> be struggling the next day. But it, was, it wasn't it was in the Bahamas. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Bahamas, I mean, it was relaxing, you know. That, that's what was cool about that place is it, it really was a good place to work because every day you're waking up with sun and, you know, beach and beautiful water and... I don't know, you could just, it was just a beautiful island to be on, like, you'd take a break and walk outside, and you're like, holy shit, like, you'd just see this giant ocean across the street from where the studio was, so it was a really cool setting, I mean, it was where Bob Marley recorded uh, some of his records there, um, 
Like, Bob Marley actually got kicked out of Jamaica, I guess. So he camped out in Nassau, Bahamas, had a house there. And basically, this was kind of his studio, and he had an apartment above the studio that he would stay at. Oh, nice. Yeah, and there's there's um, a certain part out there called Marley Island, and you could go out there, and it, like a lot of his, I think, like, there's a big Bob Marley store, and it was descendants of Bob Marley that were running it, which is kind of cool, so... I'm just yeah. picturing, like, a whole bunch of weed smoke coming up <laughs> of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they I definitely had their, island. like, blunt wraps and stuff. But, <laughs> you know, the weed out there wasn't the greatest, so it was all right. About where? <laughs> out in the Bahamas. Oh. <laughs> you know, you kind of are freaked out in a... I mean, I guess it's a third world country. It's beautiful, yeah. but, you know... Kind of. I guess, I mean, it's a lot of resorts, so you have, like, super upper class, and then yeah. you have, like... It's yeah. like going to the Dominican Republic. Yeah, it's a wonderful resort and place to see, but it's also an island that's divided. And the other half is Haiti. Yeah, and Haiti's had come on some hard times. Yeah, yeah. and they're yeah. bouncing back, but whew, it's tough. Yeah, so it's always a little weird doing anything that might be, I guess, illegal technically in an area oh, because sure. well, you want to be careful. You know, you got guys walking around with like machine guns, MP5s, oh, yeah. just turning the corner. It's like, like going down to Mexico. Yeah, there was this place that we stayed when I went down there one time where. It, they were cool with pretty much whatever you did, no big deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, as long as you weren't doing anything nuts. Yeah. But once it became nighttime, you know, after hours, on every corner there was a police officer of, like, a machine gun. Jeez. And if they were like, if you were, like, a little drunk or whatever, don't worry, just get a cab, go back to the hotel. If it's a block, two, if it's a few blocks, don't worry about it. Get a cab. Yeah. Don't walk. Don't walk, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean... It's not yeah. that it's that dangerous, it's just that you need to be careful. Yeah, I got arrested in Mexico once. Oh, yeah. You that were? Was, yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about that? Or that, no? that was pretty scary. Yeah, I'll talk about it. I mean, it was pretty funny, actually. I mean, I uh, I did something you're not supposed to do, but... <laughs> Killed uh, a hooker. Yeah. No, he wasn't. Yeah. I probably wouldn't have been there or been around Is here. Is it anything you can say, or is it a... No, no, no. It was, it was funny. Like, we... Um, Basically, I went down there with my rug, like some of the guys from my rugby team. Oh yeah. And uh, we had a rugby game, and then drove down there after. We missed the party bus down there, so we got down there and bought like, you know, we we were stupid. We're like, oh, you know, buying alcohol the whole time pre-party. And, you know, you're in college, so you're living cheap. Oh, sure, and sure. They're marking everything up at the club, so this is probably like the third night there, the second to last night or something. There's the phone party, so. Yeah, everyone loves the foam party. It's like this giant gun that makes no sense. It shoots foam, and <laughs> everybody like, gets naked. Yeah, pretty much. And pretty you're waiting in like filth and nastiness, and you know whatever else, and you can't really see like if a chick's cute or not because they're all like just covered in foam. But <laughs> whatever, you're on a dance floor having fun. So, anyways, we're about to go to the foam party, and we decided to to pre-party, and um, we thought it'd be a good idea to buy two jugs of uh, Mexican vodka, so um, two handles. Actually, it wasn't even handles. I think they were in, like, milk jug type <laughs> things, you know? Sure. And um, it, it was $2 per jug, so we bought two of them. That is some good stuff. Yeah. I think we got through one of them, and at that point, we are pretty blacked out, and I think we started getting into the next one, and it's a pretty small group of guys, maybe, like, eight eight guys, ten guys, and... Uh, yeah, you can break down one, no problem, but yeah. that's when everybody's, you know, after that one. Yeah, and I think our that problem... people. Uh, These yeah. are all rugby players too. They're big guys. Yeah, we're all from San Francisco, so our biggest problem too was is parties in San Francisco don't really start till like eleven o'clock, which you know in New York parties don't start till one. But all these other colleges that were there were used to their party starting right when they got out of school. So like six. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Being in a big city, you kind of had to. There wasn't too many house parties. It was kind of all about the bar scene. But you yeah. know, people would go out to dinner and then go to bars. So we kind of fell into that model. You pre-party at someone's house go to dinner pre-party and then go out and it's like 11 o'clock and we're like shit we better get to this place now we go and we're walking down there and there's this huge line to get into the foam party and it's already like going off and crazy probably at max capacity we're like okay we gotta wait in this fucking huge ass line so we get in line and uh you know all of us have to go to the bathroom really bad and there was this alley right around the way and there's a bathroom right around the way, too. But the bathroom right around the way, there's a Mexican dude asking for, like, $5 a person to get in to use the and bathroom. And so it was a porta potty or just an actual building? It was like actually, a door. like, a building with a door. But more like those, a public I've seen them down there. It's actually, like, a public toilet where it's yeah. actually a building. And you can, like, like, a, like, a, like, a bathroom at a nice park. Exactly. Here. Yeah. Yeah. 
and, you know, maybe a little bit dingier, but there was a guy yeah, there guarding it. Depends on where you are. Yeah. There was a guy there guarding it, so... The floors are cobblestone. Yeah, Probably so... <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I mean, so we're like, fuck this, let's go into the alley. And my friends go first, and they, they, you know, they go real quick, and the whole time I'm like the voice of reason, just being like, hey, you shouldn't do that, we're going to get in trouble. Let's they're they're running this. out going, everything went great, yeah, go well, for it, Chuck. <laughs> well, I'm still <laughs> there. And uh, I remember me and my friend Greg were like the last ones to go to the bathroom in this alley, and I just, I'm like drunk as shit, and just see these headlights coming down far down the road and I'm like huh I'm like there's no way that's a cop there, our luck isn't like that <coughs> sure enough it's Mexico luck oh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> sure enough it was a cop but um you know so then we spent about I think 18 hours down there in jail which wasn't well, they, they, they let you out or you had to go on bond or something no or 18 hours. they they gave us like yeah, we had to bribe pay. them well we did actually we bribed them but my friend that I was with so there was like Six of my friends that all were pulling out money, and between all six of them, they probably had like forty or fifty dollars. Sure, yeah, you're you know, going, everyone's you're going to a phone party. Yeah, a phone party, <laughs> and we're with the already prepaid group, so we had the wristband to get drinks. We had maybe tip money, you yeah. know, and like cab money home if we needed it. Sure, which you know, we're pretty much walking everywhere. You don't really want to get into some strangers' cars down there. So, oh, well, yeah, I know about that. Hey, when I got. I got picked up from the airport down because the guys, the cabbies, they roll up into the airport and they're like haggling with you to give you the best deal to give you a ride. Now this isn't everywhere, but where we were, it was a bit more of the old town area because we were down there to see rainforest, mm. stuff, you know. And it, and as soon as this guy, like, we, all right, all right, he, he's the guy. We got him. Boom. As soon as we get in his cab, he's like, boom, pulls off onto a dirt road out in the middle of some village of kids running around like oh man this is it but he just knew the roads and knew that he could go this way and avoid some major highway and yeah. take us where we needed to go quicker and it worked out great but at first it's like oh man he just turned onto a road that doesn't exist yeah exactly that's that's always he, fucked, he just destroyed it he yeah. earned his money that's good though you know <laughs> like i mean i guess you got kind of lucky in a way oh yeah we got to see some villages and stuff yeah but i mean this was like 2005 and yeah, things were pretty easy back then. It was the, the, where we were was like this area down where they filmed the movie Predator. It's all tropical rainforest. It's not really like a big touristy area. Yeah, stuff, so. yeah, no. So, yeah, I mean, it wasn't too bad. It was like a fifty dollar fee, I guess, and we got out. But yeah, the, all of our friends barely had any money, and our but my other friend that. went well, to the, the ATM. The bright side of that is of like money, you so. were at least in there with your boys. Yeah, one of them, and then, you know, it, it, it was It wasn't cool. like it was you and a bunch of guys who didn't speak English. Yeah. yeah. Nothing scary. Well, you know, the guys taunted us, but we were in oh, a sure. different cell, so it wasn't that bad. We are kind of, like, talking happen. shit back, you know? So, but anyways, I just remember the best part about that was uh, my friend was super drunk, wakes up in the middle of the night. We're in this prison cell. I can't obviously sleep. He could, because he was that drunk, and uh, I just watch him throw up in the toilet, and then there's this squirt bottle right next to the toilet with something yellow in it that definitely didn't look like squirt. And I watched him drink that, and then oh, throw man. up again, but and then he passed out <laughs> again. It was I don't I don't know how that happens, but you know, it was pretty nasty. It happens in Mexico. Yeah, that Mexican vodka will do that too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's jugs, bro. It was like I wonder if there was like the worm in there that I found. Oh yeah, the worm brain. at the bottom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the bottom of the tequila. Oh wait, bottle. that's tequila. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. You know who Mexican vodka? I mean, it's kind of like that'd be that's like, like Mexican, Russian tequila. Yeah, or like or like <laughs> eating Mexican food in Russia from a Russian person. A Russian person. It's probably terrible. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird thing. Remember, remember when we went to Germany and there was like the Mexican restaurants? Yeah. In Germany, and we're like, I wonder if those are any good. I wanted to try. We didn't end up going. We never we should have. Oh, well. I wanted to try the sushi spot too across from the oh, hotel. Yeah, but that was probably was probably decent. <coughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I guess you, there's lots. It was of all kinds of food there, sure. though. Where we were, uh, what was that? Didn't we go to like a Vietnamese or Korean spot? Oh, yeah, we did. What was that spot? That place was nice. It was pretty good. Uh, Everybody there was watching the big screen TV of some movie. <laughs> yeah, some Korean movie. It was some like Korean movie, so we didn't have any idea what was going on because it was Koreans watching a Korean movie, so there's no subtitles. And the crazy <laughs> thing about being in a country, it's like being in another country where 
there's always this there's like if you go to a Korean restaurant here there's this language barrier yeah, there's still a little bit of a language barrier this but, is, we're going to a Korean restaurant in Germany in Germany so they're trying to like speak German words that we don't even know what they are yeah. you know like in their Korean accent and it's like a like, whole family's restaurant pretty clearly and like the yeah. old lady remember the old lady coming out at the end like getting mad of us not eating certain parts yeah definitely she's like rearranging the trays to make yeah. sure we eat the stuff yeah for sure it was, that was good pretty, food though man yeah it was real good they did that kind of stuff to me too when I was in Germany. They would uh, they would like force um, force you to eat other trays and uh, hold hold the stuff that you were eating that you actually enjoyed back. Yeah. Just to just to try to make you eat all the food. Just to, it's yeah. kind of strange, but I guess that's common there. That's so. a deal. That's their culture. No big deal. Yeah, yeah. I'm usually when it comes to like a restaurant like that, I'm game. If they're if if the person that is working the restaurant that is like a server or waiter or whatever host. If they know that you're not accustomed to eating a certain type of food, when they're kind of helpful in that way, that's fun. Like that, remember that that one guy at the uh, the Korean barbecue spot GDC. Oh yeah. Who, who, I forgot who it was. It was wrapping their. Uh, it, you, you get like these little uh, rice paper and you dip it in the water and it makes it wet and you put vegetables and you put the uh, the meat in there and some sauce and stuff and you roll it up and you eat it. There was somebody at the table that wasn't doing that right and the guy. <laughs> Like, the host guy is just, like, stern dude walking around. And then you see his hands, and his hands are these big, rough hands. We're just always working, like, hard, hard life. Like, yeah. big knuckles. So, you know, if you punch you, it hurt, too. But just, they could bring those bowls to you, like, no big deal. And you touch the bowl, and it burns your hand. Yeah, totally. But, uh, yeah, he, did, he like leaned over to somebody, just kind of moved him out of the way, like an IT guy going, move. Yeah. <laughs> he just rolled it up for him. He's like... <laughs> Yeah, it was probably like forced or yeah. someone. <laughs> but I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. It's good. I like that treatment. Yeah, no, I mean you always. It's cool. If I'm messing up. I want to know what's right. Yeah, and they make it the best too, so it's kind of like a. Treat oh yeah, the one he rolls for you is like better than what you were given. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not you, of course, because they know you by name. Exactly. You roll in there like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I used to spend a lot of time there. I worked at that studio nearby, so. Well, yeah, if you're doing the studio and you're doing school, if you're in school, you're not. Cooking, you're not cooking meals five five times a day. Yeah. <laughs> Shit, I wish I could. That'd be awesome. So, yeah. So, you and uh, Raphael kind of decided, let's make a game. Yeah. Well, so. how did you first decide you were going to put it out here in Colorado? How'd that roll out? Well, pretty much... There was a couple of guys. That- yeah, I met Cole. And uh, Cole was kind of... Or, you know, Cole introduced me to Kedron. Mm-hmm. Um Cole worked for us for a little bit. He did like the golf cart and ghetto golf, the original. Yeah, I've seen that. And then he did the uh, this other uh, asset too, like texturing a couple houses, and they were just awesome. Like, out of everyone that I worked with, he just nailed the style. Like, obviously had it right away. And once I saw his work, I was like, wow. Like, you know, his style. It's a little bit gritty in a way. It's like kind of. He's real, he's, it has a real efficiency. To yeah, it. it's kind of like. I mean, if you look at. Denver graffiti it's very futuristic looking like the way they use edging and all that stuff it always looks like you know it's very different than LA and San Francisco it's very like yeah. future in a way and he is a for those that don't know Cole likes to do the graffiti art yeah and if you're on Polly County his name is Construct if I can't. Mm-hmm. so uh it's pretty much that and you know it, it I don't know it was kind of he introduced me to Kedron and at the time uh like Kedron worked for me for, or probably working on some freelance stuff for a few weeks and then he got laid off and once he got laid off he started doing it contract wise and he was in Denver and then brought Paul in who was doing contract work for a little bit a programmer yeah and um, I think at that time he basically had a lot of resources that he could kind of pull in Denver so he kind of basically just said oh yeah you know we should get a garage started out here you know, like, I'll work for you full-time as long as I can stay in Denver because I like it here. And, you know, at that time, I was like, cool, I, I like Denver. I came and visited once and really liked it. And I kind of wanted to keep it out of L.A. You know, San Francisco is too expensive. Seattle is too expensive. L.A. was probably too expensive, too. But it just, you know, there's a lot of people in L.A. And then also with doing the music thing as well, them being too close to each other always felt like, you know, oh, resources might get pulled into the studio more than, than like, you know, working both ways in a way. So, I don't know. Anyways, uh, yeah, so it was just kind Denver of... Denver was the right place at the right time. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we started out here, and 
that's kind of how we ended out here, which uh, ended up here. Yeah. Which is, I remember uh, before I came out here originally, uh, there was like a year or so where Catherine would just be, he'd email me or not necessarily email, but I am or whatever. However you talk on the internet, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, he'd be like, yeah, come out here, we got a studio and all this stuff. But at that point in my life, things were really going right. Yeah, definitely. So, but, you know, you guys were pretty, you, you guys were doing great on your own. You didn't really need to expand, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those are definitely fun times. It gets, it gets tough the bigger you get. I think we're at this size now where it's kind of like, it's a little, it's weird because in a way, you're, everyone's very close with each other because you're just that small. Yeah. So, but there's enough people to where, you know, someone kind of running the business end. There's a lot of, a lot of different mixed personalities. So you kind of are in this, in this state of like, you know, working with a lot of different people, a lot of different personalities, and making sure like everyone's happy with what they're doing and having a good time. But everyone's working hard. So it's kind of it's interesting because I think if we're too big, then you don't really care for the employees as much because there's just so many and the people cycling the brain out. can only remember a certain number of people yeah exactly I forget I think uh, they talked about this in those other podcasts we listened to like the Rogan cast like, like isn't it 150 people um, is, I, the, is the limit of people that you can know their face name and everything and like really know them like interact with them well I haven't heard that one yet but um, there is a limit to that that's pretty interesting yeah, if, that you, if you look it up yeah, I'm probably totally wrong yeah. but I think it is pretty it's, it's based on the way our brains developed that um, like the tribe idea that everybody's a tribe and you can only remember a, a limitation and that's just how our brains are right now well if they evolve down the years it'll be yeah. better with this internet and whatnot. that's what all the social stuff's for you can have your list of people and be like oh yeah yeah, so definitely. And so. But uh, yeah, like what you're saying is, uh, when a company gets a little bigger, your people have to start assuming roles more. Yeah. Than say, like your like president, but that, that like it's difficult for you. Like right now, we've got like ten or so guys. No big deal. Everything's great. We're all pals. Yeah. We all hang out at good times. But as it gets into a certain larger number, it's gonna be different types of people as well as the, it's just different groups of people different yeah. friends will form and you just won't be able to keep up with everybody yeah and exactly so other people will have to assume roles that you keep at a lower stage and that's kind of where that whole like management level starts to come in yeah but that you know you're looking at like 20 30 people before that really has to happen yeah definitely but i mean in a way like you know my roles definitely shifted more into management yeah lately i, I remember guess. back when you but used to go and make sounds yeah you used to have programming tools open i know now no, I, still just I have spreadsheets open though i mean i try but it's like yeah it gets tough because like well there's days where you your whole day is just answering emails yeah, because which, you have to because it's your job. It's yeah. it's more important to communicate information as in your role. Which is hard for me lately because even though I get a lot done on the business side, I feel like in the grand scheme of things that I'm slacking because I'm like, oh, I didn't get any. I of understand my what you mean. Programming duties done, you know. So I feel like, and, and it takes a lot out of you. I can't really like. It's been a lot tougher lately to work long days because. You have eight hours worth of conference calls and emails, and it's a lot of socializing and thinking and being very, like, you On know, the ball. Yeah, on the ball. It's like, I think when you're doing business, you have to, like, you have to react quickly and you have to react right. So it takes a lot of energy, and then I get does, to programming, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, like, I'll just kind of sit there and stare sometimes. So, you know, I've kind of been, like, noticing that some days I kind of have, like, this threshold. If it's, like, like these five Hulu's hours or over. getting the cut into... Yeah. By all these conference calls. Yeah, exactly. I gotta watch my shows. I know. <laughs> Damn it. I know all my Hulus. The Hulus <laughs> and the Netflix. It's like, it's nice when you could just put on a TV show and work, you know? Just kick back and code. Get some, yeah, some days I get, the same way. I really I, get a lot I done. I can't like, sit there. I don't know what it is. It's like, I think, actually, here's my explanation of it. Here's my monitor space, right? And there's people in the background moving, making noises farting, burping, that's just Paul mm-hmm. and Toby. But you know, you know, all this stuff is going on so it helps my brain to have, I've got what I'm working on over here on this monitor, kind of moving and flashing and whatnot because of all the particles. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got something moving and flashing on this monitor which will be just a show. 
Like if it's just music, I can kind of get distracted really easy. But if it's just something moving, it's usually if it's I'll watch something I've watched before, like a DVD. Yeah. So I've watched a thousand times, so I don't actually have to focus on it or pay attention. It's just moving, so that my eyes have these two targets to focus on, and all this stuff is just zoned out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, kind of going back to Paul and Toby, <laughs> I'm actually surprised. I mean, I'm a little disappointed in Paul. He's not really like Toby's kind of beating him on the on the smelliness, you know. <laughs> I don't know. About that. <laughs> No, but we don't. I'm just talking shit. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm not. We don't. Talking want, shit. We don't want just... to. No, we don't want to outrank one of these guys on stink because then they're going to listen to this. Exactly. And they're going to start. Fight, they're going to start fighting because they war each other mm-hmm. all the time. And what you need to do. And we'll be caught in the crossfire. What you need to do is you need to get these guys the desks next to each other so they can properly express themselves. To battle each other, but yeah. then kind of leave a little corner. Because that's how they space. used to be. They used to remember at the old studio they used to be by each other so they could battle. If, it, if need be, well, who I was caught in the crossfire. But yeah, was, I was gonna say yeah. whoever's on either was, side, well, of both next of them to us is really screwed. Like you, would, it would have been you and Dan that would have been screwed at the old office. One, yeah. Actually, yeah, what we should do is we should, take, we should take, we should take, we should take whoever, uh, you know, whoever we don't like the, le- <laughs> <laughs> whoever we don't like at the office, and put them in the middle between the two of them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's actually messed up. <laughs> that is messed up. That's like torture. Yeah, it is. It's worse than waterboarding. No, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> That'd be a good podcast, Waterboard Brian. <laughs> well, see, it's, that's just more like, like 13 seconds of entertainment, not really a podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm going for longer. Yeah. Once we do it, I'm gonna go. For, I'm gonna shoot for at least 14. Have, have you been practicing just holding your breath? No. <laughs> what you should do is take baths and practice holding your breath, breath, or just go to your pool wherever you don't have. You don't have a pool at your place, do you? Um, no, I well, don't. You can find a pool. You can jump the wall at Kettering's. We'll yeah. do it all the time. We get in trouble, but, or you can do it here. You know, whatever. Jump in the bath. Put your head in the sink. Practice <laughs> holding your breath so that your first run will be good. All right, all right. And I actually talked to Toby tonight. Uh, he's going to teach me how to swim properly. Yeah, well, yeah. that's good. He, he knows how to swim. Because um, I used to case. teach swimming lessons too. I bet he knows more though. He did it through high school. Like I picture myself as like a land air guy. Like I'm I'm good on the land. I'm pretty quick, and I I feel like I can fend for myself. So if like someone needed help, I could protect them on land. <laughs> But, like, in the water, I'd, <laughs> yeah. I'd be like a little girl or a cat. Like Aquaman. Look, here's the trick. You jump in, you put your arm around their neck, and you swim out. <laughs> the you idea know. is to immobilize them. Yeah, Because yeah. they're going to be like, oh, and they're going to drag you down. You put your arm around their neck and drag them around. Oh. Okay. You know what would make for some good entertainment, though? Putting in, and I'm not saying this because, you know, I did make the, the comment and say we should put who we like the least in the middle. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not saying sure, this yeah, at all. It's no big deal. We no probably, one understands we what probably, we're talking about anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We probably like him the most, so... But it would make for some good entertainment if we put Dom in between Toby and Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dom's always entertaining. Yeah, exactly. He always, he he always to, seems to find something to... He's our QA guy, uh, Dominic. He likes to... He's almost Tracy Morgan. Like, he... When something's on his mind, he just lets it out. He's just like, Damn, dude! That girl's got titties that I like. <laughs> that's it. And he'll, you know, he'll say stuff like that, and that's it's very. No, he's open got he's got a bunch of bunchy bunch of funny lines. Yeah, like, he's got a bunch of funny lines. He's a funny guy. Dude. He's today, fun to hang out with. Yeah, today he had a near death experience. Yeah, it's, oh man. He's that. driving down the highway, and the tire on his it's this truck that isn't even his car because his car got messed up. We don't even go into that because that is incriminating. Yeah, you can't really go into that kind of stuff because it wasn't him; it was somebody else. But. And the tire flies off of his car. That would scare me to death. But it wasn't like, you know, I think when you think of a tire popping or coming off, you think of, like, the tread, the, the whole tire coming off, but, like, the rim staying there. I mean, you could still kind of drive on a rim a little bit. Well, it's, you know, sparks are flying, but yeah. you, you're not really... You've seen those police chases where they're going straight, but if you're not ready for it... Yeah, exactly, but... You better pull over quick. This was, like, the actual lug nuts coming off and the entire rim with the tire yeah. and everything on it yeah it's just rolling into a gas station oh, and it was, taking out somebody's grandma yeah it, was, it definitely was like a right mile into the and a Kmart half parking lot. yeah it was definitely a mile and a half down the freeway when I came to pick him oh, up oh wow yeah it was a good mile and a half forward so it shot forward hit the center divide then went all the way back over here wow now meanwhile he's on everybody else is whatever that now. thing is the small little like plate yeah, that, yeah whatever like you know, the car completely fell, and he's 
merging over three lanes with like one whole side missing. It's, it's carving a line in the highway, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's pretty, pretty bad experience for him. It's scary. He's you know lucky that nothing happened to anybody. Yeah, nobody got lucky. hit by that. He didn't hit anybody. Nobody ran into him. He got off the road. Which, do you know which lane he was in? Uh, well, he had to get like, over a few, right? Yeah, yeah, I think he was. He had to get over a couple, so he was probably oh, in like the third lane. Yeah, and I mean, he was going like sixty two, you know, sixty miles an hour. Oh well, yeah, that's that that really truck's sucks. not really a speedy truck. Yeah. What well, was the driver's side tire? And that seems most. That seems like the more important tire if you need to get to the to the right. And he had to get to the yeah. right. So I don't know. Just a minor, Maybe. minor detail. <laughs> a minor detail that could make a big difference, in my opinion. Oh um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Especially front tires, those are usually the worst because you can fishtail at that point, you know. Unless you're in four wheel drive, right? There you go. Or one of those cars that has the wheels. No, we're getting pretty uh, far off the pace. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We got a little bit into uh, company stuff. That's all good and all, but people enjoy that stuff. But uh, you know, all fifty of them. And thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> nice, you're up to fifty. Now we haven't really been uh, aggregating the podcast yet because we're still, like I said, figuring out. But this might be worth posting. Because yeah. we got a huge superstar such as yourself. Yeah, right. Yeah. Who's been on YouTube before. That's right. <laughs> Machinima Cup. interviews. And yeah. That's it. No. Good whopping couple, few thousand people, maybe. <laughs> it's, it's better than what I've done on YouTube. Yeah. Chris knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> when uh, you guys first started the Ophonic Studio, you were just in a garage. We don't need to say the guy's name. The guy's garage. Yeah. Uh, this was just a. When did you first move into that garage? Like what month? I'm just like it was in winter. Uh. Or it was one of the. It had to be in one of the cooler months. When you yeah. No, in. it was actually right before winter. Or it was right around winter because I remember it snowing when mm-hmm. I was there. So um, that could have been April. It was towards the end <laughs> of the winter. Yeah. It was probably like. February, February, March. March. So yeah, that's fine. So you're March, in a garage there, and you've got all your computers. So, and you put a space heater if you even needed it. Yeah, it stays pretty warm. Cause you got guys. We did, in I there, used to sleep computers. with the. I used to sleep in the middle of a snowstorm with the door open in that garage because it was so hot with computers. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. This was three years. This was about three years ago. Right? Yeah, it was about three years ago. I think. Two thousand eight, like, maybe. Or yeah. So yeah, they got started in a garage where snow was coming in to keep it cool. Yeah. In the winter. But then summer came along. Summer came and we all hated each other. We pretty much like, you know, one guy was like, that we hired was like, oh, I'm going to work from home and then ended up getting another job because he, you know, I mean, I probably It's it's kind of one of those things where, well, you kind of have to give people slack for being like, I can't do this because you're in a hot garage. It's, It's... Yeah. It's torture, you know. They had they, they used to have it back in the old uh, prisons. They have the old hot box. Yeah. Throw you out there. I'm sure you've seen cartoons. Oh yeah, I mean we all hated each other during that time because it was 100 degrees. We're trying to make this game and figure shit out. We're just trying like, to get over. Yeah. Just yeah. Trying to get somebody to recognize you. Exactly. Just trying so, to make it. Yeah. So, but at that time, um, I actually moved out of my apartment in L.A. and moved in. Uh, and started staying at Raphael's house because he had an extra room. So, um, you know, that helped because then I was able to use the money that I would spend on an apartment in L.A. and get one out in, in Denver. And this is when I was probably still in L.A. more. Like Yeah, yeah. You know, so... Most of your stuff's still out in L.A. You got, like, a hot rod out there, right? You got a nice car? Yeah, I got my car out there. I have, like, an entire house worth of stuff. Or, oh, like, like apartment... Full of stuff. I need to get an apartment full of stuff. Look at my walls. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, I, somebody recently commented, commented on my apartment. They said, "Oh, it's like an insane asylum because it's just white walls." <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of zen with that. Like I'm just. You know, it's kind of nice. Everything it, is empty and clean. But it's very clean. Yeah. With that in mind, I, I'm probably gonna expand on what's actually in here. Like get some, uh, get some things on the walls like behind you guys. Yeah, that would be. Cool. Maybe I'll print up some of my portfolio art and put it behind there <laughs> to, to really. It's really feed my ego by showing off my art in every podcast, you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm just, just right in between us, too, uh-huh. where it's almost like a third person kind of sitting Oh, yeah, like, a, like individually <laughs> set it up. Yeah, it'll be perfect. Good idea. Thanks for that. We're going to do that. Yeah. No, but, um, so yeah, you're in a garage, the early startings of a phonic. What is it? Was it just three of you at that point, or was there... It was... The fourth guy was another programmer, right? Or did you have more... Well, it, it got to, I think it was me um it was me and Kedron 
and then it went to uh, a programmer that was kind of more like a like you know his background was technical director so he was another programmer and um, you know he was kind of the third guy at the time and I think that lasted maybe six weeks and you know Paul was contracting a little bit but not doing too much because he was so busy at Net Devil um, and then eventually he um, left Net Devil and came to work for Ilphonic and then at that time too like right around when we had that guy there uh, we had James Haynes come and intern and he was interning for a while in there and uh, so it's basically like four or five guys so yeah it was four uh, pretty much it never got bigger than he was four. spending more time in LA anyway so yeah that was a- it never got bigger than four. But it's but still yeah. a garage. Yeah. It was hot as crap full of guys mm-hmm. that are game developers. So if you don't... Look, game developers are nasty. The end. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it was nasty. Um, I remember I used to, like... it. Would, some days it would be cold. You know, you'd have the door open, but you wouldn't want to go outside and walk across, like, the backyard to get to the house to go to the bathroom so yeah i used to like pee in bottles and <laughs> <laughs> throw them that's, away in the garbage because i was ghetto like that that's so, a rough start yeah you know so uh gotta do what you gotta do but yeah and then eventually when i had more cash i went and you know when i got rid of my apartment in la and stayed with Raphael, i got an apartment in uh that's sort of a slogan peeing in bottles to ps3 you yeah, funny exactly anyway sorry you gotta milk that stuff. Tell people how let, exactly. let people know how hard stuff was back in the days. Cause yeah, they don't know how much that you put in. Most people can't even get a game studio going, but you guys, you know, you you, you toughed it out the hard way. Yeah, it was definitely tough. I mean, it's still like it's still in this like tough in it state. I mean, I feel well, we sure have, you're not like easy street yet. Yeah, the game's not out yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll just be happy for the day when we can make games and not really have to, like... Yeah, I think you always worry what's around the corner and, you know, it's like just to be able to make games and be like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna make this game for three years and things are gonna be fine and dandy for these next few years, and which I don't think ever will happen. For sure. But... And if you nail a game that becomes really popular at least or not really but popular enough to warrant sequels yeah. or updates that gain more money or more revenue toward the company then you can work on that for a few years like that's that's kind of one of those things we're doing now where sequels are the, the money yeah um, on the topic of uh, how hard it is to start up a studio in your own company um, one of my buddies is uh, I, I don't know if he's interning or if he's actually working working for another independent company in Denver, but um, he's he's working with them, and I actually, him and I have been good friends yeah, all through true. college. So I basically talked to him and said that, um, like, uh, they just released um, a game for the iPhone, and uh, they're, I think they're wanting to start to charge money for that, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what they're doing. I don't even know their name yet, yeah. but I talked to Colton, my buddy, to see if, he maybe wanted to uh, like get in contact with us and uh, come and visit the studio. We could hang out or something. Because I remember Kedrin yeah, mentioned in the this other... This podcast day. isn't just talking crap. We're making deals on the show, people. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, I mean, I just remember Kedrin making a remark the other day. That he said something like, um, us game developers need to need to stick together in regards to um, Blunt Campaign. Oh, over, yeah. So. Definitely. Um, so I don't know. I just thought it'd be pretty cool to come tour the studio, see what. It yeah, no, it'd be awesome for sure. Like, so. Yeah, no, I mean it's always like the startup phase is always. It's kind of fun. It's probably, I guess, the funnest because you don't know what's around the corner. I guess we're still start sort of starting up until we put out a game, but you it's, know, it's always a gamble. Yeah, we do have a publisher now, which is awesome, and then you know we'll kind of see. See the next game. I'm really excited about Ghetto Golf getting that done and wrapped up. But you know, I think there's a lot of good stuff on the horizon. I think we proved to be a pretty valuable and very a, a very good team in the industry. Dedicated. Yeah, and we have some great people behind us. You know, like yeah. some really good other uh, people that help us with our business side of things. Help me with the business side of things. Are you know very well known in the industry, very well liked, and have you know some of the biggest clients that have made some of the biggest games that everyone plays and it's awesome to be a part of that you know yeah. 
to have all this that. support behind us. Yeah, exactly. And that's what that's that what I'm saying is these guys don't they don't have any support behind them. I mean, so yeah. I just thought it'd be cool, but yeah. yeah so definitely. you guys were we guys started out in the garage, and then when did you, you guys got a studio apartment afterwards? Yeah, I had a studio. Well, I got I couldn't stay, live there anymore because it was just a terrible situation. Like, yeah. It, so you guys, it wasn't it wasn't a matter of you guys expanded at all. It was just no. It was just like I'm gonna get an apartment, and then I drove to the office and we did that for a couple months or drove to the garage i'm sorry but uh you know and and like my apartment was probably it was a small studio apartment so it wasn't that big and oh see i didn't know it was actually your apartment that everyone yeah. was working out of that's no we all yeah it got so hot we we're just like screw it let's move to my apartment and was this the, the one that you guys were at when i yeah you okay that's what i was thinking about well, i was about to come back and mention what was the next spot yeah, that was it. Was and it that, was that spot? That was that spot, which was my apartment for like I think two or three months before we moved in there. So I was actually driving. Like I was telling Brian, I was driving to, uh, you know, we're driving to the garage to go work, and uh, you know, we're all kind of meeting there, and and I'd go back to this apartment, and then eventually I'm like, wait a second, this place has air conditioning, you know, mm-hmm. and. It has a door that I can go in that no one really sees anyone. <laughs> it has a door. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. Well, it, it has air conditioning and a door. Mm-hmm. You yeah. fuck, are you That's sh- a good deal. Whoa. It had a door away from the office. So I figured we could have people come and work there all day and not, not them like question yeah. why there's so many people in there kind of thing. So. Sure. No, it was. Um, I'll just say my first impression of it was it was nasty because game developers are nasty. Yeah. No. It, the point it, you can't. It, it, it's people. It's, it wasn't. It was. Traffic. Yeah. It was the fact that you got, you had a, it was four guys in there. Yeah, you were the moving fifth. around all the time, and I ended up being the fifth guy. And uh, I was in the corner. I was in the corner on this side of him was Chuck. On the next side of him was Kettering. And, and by the next side of me, he was, he was as close as Brian is right now to Chuck. Oh, he was oh, beside wow. me. We had a little bit more space. Yeah. But um. Well, yeah, we had. It, the, it was actually really intimate. Yeah. So I, I had like a great relationship with Kettering then. Now he's in that office all alienated, going, oh, shucks, sure miss the guys. I know. I think we all do. <laughs> That's the problem. Like, well, you, you're kind of in that spot where I know you like to come out just to, you know, every now and again, just be like, oh, I just want to talk to people. Yeah. But you're kind of at that spot where people always walk by you. So they always go like, oh, I want to check up to you. Yeah. And just come in every now and again. So yeah. at least we see you. Yeah. yeah. Kedron's a little bit in like a weird area. It's like. A wa- almost like a prison cell. It is. I guess you'd say it's kind of. <laughs> if if we could just we, entrance, could, so. we could close that door and put like a a piece of wood between the railing and that that big handle, and he could never come out again. Yeah, definitely. And that's the kind of thing that could happen to him some night as a prank. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's I, I kind of wish I could get in a spot like that because I'm just you know pure artist, so I just like to kick back in the quiet. Yeah, I mean, I think the the biggest reason why we had the offices, which was weird because. I think it was a big transition for us because we felt, both of us felt like, oh, damn, we miss hanging out with the guys. And we also felt that, like, almost like the relationship in a way with everyone kind of changes in a way because it's not like you're right next to someone where you're just like, hey, look at this on the screen. It's kind of like you lose, like, this buddy-buddy mentality with certain people that you sit next to. And it's just like, you know, even at our old office, we were in a circle, which was awesome. But unfortunately... You know, like I'm on, dude. It, I'm on phone calls that deal with business in a, in, in, a, in a in a clear, better for everyone business sense. Getting a separation mm. for everyone, like so, everyone has their personal space. Is going to be worth it in the yeah. long run. You just like, uh, like okay, after after the studio apartment, like how long were you been at that studio apartment? It was about a year and a half right working there. there. I remember being there, and I was like, look. To take this job, you guys are going to have to incentive me with a, an office because this is a studio apartment, but I still work there for like months. Yeah, totally. <laughs> before, we, before we moved into that I one I think we studio. promised you would get one and soon, well, because and it was like a good it, few months. Look, it wasn't like me being an asshole or anything, yeah. but it was five guys in a room. I don't, I don't want... The oh, room was, was smaller than this because I used it, to, it was separated like at that line by another kitchen. Yeah. Yeah, it was, James it was sat just in the so kitchen. Small. It was just small. We just needed more room to breathe, to be creative, to be just so we couldn't get, you know. Yeah, James. It was tight. Yeah, James sat in the kitchen. <laughs> Literally sat in the kitchen. And then, 
I sat against one wall, but right next to that wall was a closet, and Paul slept in yeah, that, that closet. Yeah, that was his closet <laughs> that he slept in. And the other closet housed the servers. Mm-hmm. The other... <laughs> Yeah, it was actually like an area. And it was a bathroom. Right we didn't want to touch anything. Yeah, the bathroom was disgusting, and uh, you know, then I would sleep in the middle. I'd move the chairs aside and sleep in the middle. Blow so the air mattress up and sleep in the middle. Yeah, every night. Yeah, and, and the middle. Remember how for so long the middle was just a box? It oh had, yeah. Like Xbox controllers and remotes on it, so we could act. And there was a big TV. Yeah. And just a big TV would just run all day, with like. Um, Oh, like, Always Sunny or Trailer Park Boys or South Park or mm-hmm. Howard Stern. Yeah. Just all day in that studio. So, I mean, it, being in, like, that tight area, it's fun for a while. Yeah. But, you know, after a, after a year or so, you guys are like, okay, we got to yeah, we gotta get away from each other. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was fun for sure. I mean, I kind of like that. I mean, I, I miss being around people, you know? Like, I wish, I think if if there was a way where I could sit next to everyone and work next to everyone and then... You know, go into an office when I need to and do yeah. that. That'd be awesome. Well, you know, it'd be great as um, you talking about moving upstairs. How that upstairs area is like what it is downstairs, but it's spread out so far. Mm-hmm. If we could find a way to just keep, you, you could still keep everybody in the same area, but just like, here's the programmer area and here's the artist. Area. Like really spread yeah. it out. But we're gonna have just, to, just especially if we, if we, you know, move up to like twenty five guys or something. Oh yeah, and who, get uh, when that's gonna happen? Yeah. yeah. Then we'll definitely need our areas and try to figure out what we're going to do mocap and all that. Too. It'll get tight. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. You just, right now when everybody's like, oh, no, i got to take a call. So they'll get a call and they'll be like, hello? Uh, okay, hold on. And they'll, they'll yeah. go walk back to the conference room or outside or something. Because mm. it's not that they're, like, trying to keep secrets. It's because we're in one room and it's a big room and it really echoes a lot. So if you're talking quietly, everybody can understand you. Yeah, and yeah. even then, it's always awkward when you're having a conversation, yeah, no yeah, matter yeah, what yeah, it's you about. Yeah, be on the phone. Hey, what's up? I'm on the phone right here in front of <laughs> everybody. Yeah, it's cool. They're just working. Yeah, <laughs> yeah don't <laughs> worry about does, that. Nobody does that. Everybody yeah. gets it once, but it's very polite. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, after we had our studio... Studio like tiny spot. We moved into the uh, the bigger one. Yeah, which is really nice. It's uh, like, like ten foot ceilings. Um, used to be like a business, so it's got it had a downstairs. Yeah, which we set up as an entertainment room. We had like couches and a big screen TV and all that, and little kitchen area set up. Um, the upstairs main area had a, another TV set up, but that was mostly for people testing and whatnot. Um, yeah, there was a whole conference room slash mocap room which is great mocap in there all day and all the guys were in this main pit area which was pretty spread out for the number of guys at the time when we first moved into there was it still just us five or have we brought in somebody else at that point yeah I think it was five it was just you five because mm-hmm. I was the sixth and then Toby was the seventh and we, we were hired, like, right at the same yeah, time. Like, yeah, very closely hired. Mm-hmm. So. But, yeah, that was a really big spot. And then we ended up moving things around at times, but it was a really great spot because, uh, like, we had uh, artists come in and graffiti the whole place. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I kind of miss that, to be honest. It yeah, it's pretty cool. But I like the zen the zen of our um, our work now, the way it is now. It's, it's pretty nice. Yeah. The brick and then... Yeah, it's definitely... Like it's like a rock and roll album cover, brick wall behind us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's definitely an interesting area, watching all the shit go down in that neighborhood i mean the worst part obviously is the club but it's actually you know where we are now or yeah back then uh now well, back then we were on the first floor yeah so we had our big window looking out at everything <laughs> and that would be really interesting on some nights but on other nights you kind of want to close it because you don't want a bunch of ruffians yeah it kind of made me nervous looking in at all this equipment of a full game dev studio that are Deving for the console, so we've got all these dev kits everywhere. Yeah, it just looks like a bunch of Xboxes and a bunch of Playstations, but they're not. If if you steal one of these things, you can't do anything with it. Yeah, mm-hmm. it yeah. doesn't play regular games. You have to have like all the software. It doesn't do anything. Yeah, it is useless. Yeah, one of our friends that has a studio. I'm saying that so no one steals it. Yeah, but no, no it, had, it doesn't do anything. It really yeah, doesn't. we had a friend who their studio got broken into and. You know, all the Xboxes got taken, and uh, they found a bunch of them, like, you know, like, not too far away from the place, like, in dumpsters and, like, broken on the ground. Like, yeah, because they found out they just, didn't work. Yeah, people were just like, oh, this is broken. Yeah. You know, oh, there's only one game it in only, here. It is only for development. You can't <laughs> Probably the development time, you know, like, to even get a game running, you probably have to, like, 
pretty much do the Konami code to get something to work <laughs> in early development, so, you know, I'm sure they were pretty pissed. But yeah, that second studio, the one, the one, the one on the first floor, it was really nice. So mm-hmm. Had a good time. We, were, we grew out of that really quick. Yeah. So, um, through the development of Nexus. Yeah. Because actually, when we first moved into that, um, we had that GDC, but uh, we started Nexus. Yeah. Because uh, we started, we pretty much started on Nexus in January. When we moved into that when spot. When we moved into that spot in January of, uh, was it 2010? Yeah. And we started on it for three months of that, and then we were, in the three months, we're at a GDC. With four, was it four? Yeah, it was four. It was one, two, three, four, then five. Yeah, it was four, I think. Yeah. There was three, and then the one, the, the one TV. Right. So it was the three oh, no, smaller. Maybe it was five. I think it was five because it was like it was yeah, two right. screens, like a regular, big, pretty decent sized screen, like a twenty-two or twenty-four inches of Samsung. Yeah, it was. Yeah, there's four of those and there was a big screen I forgot how big that was all running on PlayStation 3 the game we wanted to make three months boom like that everything went great great reception all that we discovered Crytek switched to that engine had to bring in you know things got serious we're like oh we gotta make this game we gotta expand and we moved to this new office this is the place that uh, Ilphonic's at now so this is this new office is on the second floor Bigger, deeper, yeah, longer, uncut. We use like half the space, but it's nice to have a big space. Yeah, it's actually working out great because you've got your own office, Kevin's got his own office. We made jokes about that earlier, but it's good. Yeah. There's a larger area for everybody to sit in. We've got a little workout area and an entertainment area. And then, you know, there's a whole lot of other area beyond that that's kind of storage that we could be using better. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, we'll, we'll, I think the idea, too, was... You're not going to throw people around mid-dev. Like, yeah. It's waste time. I mean, the idea, too, is is there was a lot of, like, other things on the horizon. So oh, we, we got a whole tester room, too. There's yeah. a whole huge hall. Of yeah. Anyway. I felt there was a lot of things on the horizon at the time, so we're like, oh, in six months, it could get really crazy, and we're going to need all this space, you know, so we might as well ha- get it, it now. It could have happened at any time. You would have yeah. never known... Mm-hmm. It's like I said, it's so volatile. You would have never known, but yeah. everything's kind of worked out how it has. Yeah, definitely. And moving mid project like is such a pain, so you wouldn't yeah. want to do that. Yeah, yeah you made a good said. choice. Yeah, we're trying to get upstairs at some point because then we'll. Be, we were excited about upstairs. Yeah, yeah. A little what more away it? from the sound. It's like Huge a ten foot ceilings. ceilings on the second floor, but on the third floor, these ceilings are ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. who even knows how high they are? I'd have to ask a gymnast. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, they're probably like a twelve plus feet. Yeah, they're definitely probably twice the size of you if you were to stand on your head. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, so I mean that's nice. There's a lot of sound in it that we have to deaden, but that's pretty easy. We fill it with gear and then oh yeah, you know, put some curtains up, drapes well, down. It would be useful to put up like get us some kind of cubicle wall stuff. Yeah, and I don't mean like cubicle walls. We could have like our own choice of decor. Like you put up like a like a curtain, like you said, goes yeah. across a way or like a one of those oriental shutters yeah you know well, whatever it's, speaking of that that was uh i saw this old picture of pixar when they were starting up and it was kind of a similar type room it was just this big room and they you in similar yeah they, they put a well similar I don't know there's no i similar? or there's no you it's similar? an i similar 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 i just always i just always thought that's funny i'm sorry yeah no, i don't but i don't know how to word no. <laughs> it's, it's cool with the internet you're just typing who cares exactly yeah i don't need to speak that's as funny as like you know <laughs> why are we doing this <laughs> it's like Forrest. the first time i met him he was calling wi-fi 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 and i didn't understand oh why God. he was calling it wi-fi but i used to have a boss that he was a he was a good guy but his 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 vernacular was uh, limited yeah, he didn't have the lexicon of the university professor, if you will. Yeah, I just threw out all the big words I knew to make me sound smart. But but uh, he he would often learn words from the internet or like a tutorial <laughs> or something, and didn't know that it was pronounced a certain way. Yeah, and he would go for long times using this word, or possibly he would learn one longer word or a variation of another word, and, and he would just use that all the time even inappropriately <laughs> those are always funny it's yeah it is it's it's kind of <laughs> like okay uh but you know i mean it happens but yeah so anyways i i saw this picture of pixar and they totally had like the chinese little things 
separating uh, whatever those are called, separating the rooms and kind of they use them for cubicles and stuff like that. I mean, it was a really crazy picture because it well, kind of showed is, you the struggle. Like a way. cubicle wall isn't bad as long as you are putting stuff all over it. Mm. But if, if you get some proper decoration, like something that actually looks nice, something that's actually inspiring to look at in the first place. Yeah, cubicles are stupid expensive. Yeah, they are, aren't they? What is, yeah. all, what is that all about? I think they it's just like, get some plywood. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, particle board. I think particle anything's, board. Anything's cheaper than. I think for a decent cubicle, it's like three thousand, thirty-two hundred. Wow, that is ridiculous. Yeah, desk and everything, but uh, just go down to like a American Furniture Warehouse or whatever and buy whatever is a fake wall. Yeah. Buy a shelf that's tall. Buy an armoire. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> buy, buy one of those little mobile closets. Mm-hmm. Like they sell in all the video games. Basically, the modular closet that you place. Yeah. That'd be awesome. So anyway, yeah, it's big and it's like a cubicle, but you can use it. It's, util- it's utilitarian. Yeah. And then you can put a whiteboard on top of that, too. Hell. Yeah. You can go crazy. We need to hang up our whiteboards at the office. The whiteboards are those. all leaning against walls. I know. I, know. I, I miss, I miss those. Yet. There's not That's a one up so we can we can draw dicks on it. We need that. I know. The that most important thing about a dev studio is having creative outlets all around. Like, I think one of those major studios, like possibly at Pixar or somewhere, you can look it up. They have a whole room with the whole walls of the room with that whiteboard material. Oh, yeah. So you can just rip 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 all over. And I think it's probably like a main meeting room. But it, that, that seems really inspiring. And yeah. also disgusting. What's kind I think of funny about is what you people are yeah. going to draw. I mean, that's pretty much all they're used for. I mean, you know, you do use them in meetings, but... Just so been, useful when you really need a quick idea. Yeah, I've been to a lot of places where you see, like, ideas on the whiteboard, and you're like, oh, that's from a couple months ago. Yeah. You know, so they don't update too frequently, but I think, like, you know, I mean, I've seen well, probably some of the best dick monsters ever. Dude, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on a whiteboard. <laughs> I kind of miss those. There was that, remember that, we were making the RPG monsters, Brian? Yeah. <laughs> there were, at our last studio, <laughs> we kept filling this whiteboard up with uh, like RPG monsters that were every single one was a stupid pun yeah <laughs> he would do one and then I would do and one and we could go like back and forth I can, lord if I can remember any of them like, I remember <laughs> some of the visuals but I don't remember like the names that go with I don't we did either. so many there were every single one was like a like a like a vagina and a plant mix <laughs> yeah that was the one that or like I forgot about that one like a penis and anything else oh that's right mixed. Yeah. yeah like very much like a Pokemon yeah is very is very Pokemon inspired, but I think that's one thing that I that and um, the whiteboard being hung up and the being able to see the camera monitor at the old studio are the two things. Oh I miss. God, I miss the monitor. Because yeah, remember we we we'd always like you could always see the monitor from where you were sitting in the old yeah. office, so you always saw when people were standing outside the windows doing something crazy. Yeah. And, I was, I was laughing earlier because I remember that one where Chris was like, there's two people making out. There's two making out. <laughs> Basically, let me explain it real quick. We had two, uh, we had our, our, our basic security set up. Uh, we had a back door and a front door. The uh, the back door came up this direction, so the, the camera was up here and faced out this direction, so we could see people coming. You could see up to a few people, their parking spots, and we could just basically watch the lot and see who's coming to the door. Which in this neighborhood is not a terrible neighborhood, but as we learn from that Ill vid- that video, if you YouTube it, Ilphonic arrested, we should have been keeping the doors locked all the time. Yeah, and that would have saved us a lot of time that night. Yeah, I'm surprised we kept the doors unlocked. Well, that was you know the reason it was unlocked. Smoking. Smokers. Yeah. Because they would just get up and go smoke, and they didn't want to take the time to go. Uh. Yeah. Because there is nobody lazier than smokers. I'll I always liked it. it, but I'd get called a pussy when. Uh, you know, I wouldn't lock it, so I had to be cool and not lock it. I had a thing. I would always lock it. Just yeah, because, I would always lock it. Too. Because I always knew some... Because I would see people, because next door to us was a weed store. Yeah. Or a marijuana dispensary. But no, it was, you know, it was a this crazy place. Like, a, they, they were... There was nothing wrong with the people. Around there. Everybody was fine. Most people came in, no big deal. But there was a lot of places. Uh, this was right around Denver when they first started opening up all these dispensaries. They were getting hit. And they were getting hit regular. Yeah. And so, it, there was a concern. It was a legitimate concern. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, uh... And there's hobos all over the place. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess not to change the subject, but one thing I'm curious is in how 
you guys got started as artists or how you knew like you wanted to I guess maybe make a living doing art because it's just something that to me it's like you know I mean being a professional making a living doing artwork is pretty incredible I mean you know it's incredible not it not many people get that opportunity I'd say you know everyone growing up there's I'll tell you what half the people I'll tell you what artists. Charles Brungar so Ilphonic.com Nexus.com the podcast number three was breaking into the industry we actually talked about that okay however throw in a brief if you haven't listened to it and if you have listen to it again <laughs> uh for me, I was kind of the same way. Around sixth grade, I got into computers because we had a program where we got to just do different things in the morning. Um, they called it the gifted program, but I'm retarded, so whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm special. Yeah, so that's how I ended up in that one. Yeah. There's all the smart kids and me. How did that happen? <laughs> no, the questions were, which are different? Uh, dog, person, cat, tree. Look, if you couldn't figure that out in sixth grade. Dog, cat, Sorry. person, tree. Which is a different one? If, it, if they were written down, you'd get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't you, know. You think about that. You think about that. <laughs> it was the tree. <laughs> it was the tree. The answer was the tree. I was going to say the tree naturally, but... Yeah, yeah but you were probably just thinking they're all living things, but... Yeah, yeah, which is larger? The sun, the earth, the moon, or Venus? The sun, the earth, the moon, the... Oh, what's larger? Yeah. Out of all of them? Yeah. The sun? Nice. Okay. Nice, dude. But <laughs> you got $100 on your But see, that's the there. problem with me, is that question you asked me, that's like the shit that I, I couldn't do because I would think It's a certain logically. type of thinking. It's a certain type of I'd be like, well, they're logic. all alive. All these... Yeah, yeah, exactly. All the these cats are opposite logic of a dog. Based questions. And that's why yeah. I don't know... I don't know what these questions were based on. But I remember every year watching every kid take it and being like, and I remember taking it and being like, what is this? Are you kidding me here? Done. Jesus Christ. And seeing all these other kids just blow it. And this this group that they pulled us out of were like six to ten kids. I just didn't understand it as a kid. I'm like, how do you not know these things? But it was just one of those things where the way I thought was a little bit different. And what it turned out to be was uh, problem-solving skills. Oh, okay. And so they ended up putting us on this situation where to solve problems, like weird problems. And we ended up going, anyway, I don't want to, I'm, I'm, I'm totally breaking off the subject. But what happened was the first 30 minutes of elementary school for us, instead of going to whatever class it was, we were deemed too good for that class. But well, we blew it in those, I guess. But um, one of those was computers. And we got to, I did, we got to program for like three by five floppies and yeah, and I just thought I was I like you said your story about getting your NES. I was the same way. I just got my Nintendo a few years earlier. I think I got it in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And oh my god, it was great. And I'm like, the first thing I was gonna do is I'm gonna make Super Mario. I'm gonna make a Donkey Kong. Whatever I can do with this limited, this thing could put like a few blocks on the screen, and that was it. Yeah. So I did my best to make a little thing where you ran this way and you jumped up and went back forth a few times before there was a guy that killed you. Because I couldn't, you know, make the combat work. Yeah. But the point was, that was the first game I made. And as I got older, when I graduated high school, I got enough money, like just my graduation money, I got just enough to buy the, sh the crappiest computer at Circuit City. Yeah. That's... I and at the time it was probably like what a Tandy. It was or something it was like that. a little better totally than that. It was sold. like an it was like an actual computer, like an actual PC. Mm -hmm. But. I mean, it was it was enough that I think it could run Quake after my buddy gave me a new graphics card or something. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, I just started. Uh, before then, I was modifying Doom with another computer and Duke Nukem and all that stuff. Anything that had an editor. Did you and, actually like? Did you draw before then? Did oh God, that's all I did was draw. Oh, okay, cool. So like, you did have like an I, art background. Here's my entirety of junior high to high school was whatever class I would have was either the class that I drew in or I slept. Yeah. <laughs> it was one or the other. That was all that was. But, um... Yeah, so I, I drew all the time, got into games. After I got... Like I said, I got to, got to graduate from high school. 
Found enough money to buy a PC, started modding Quake. Because that was uh, right when the internet was invented. Mm -hmm. That was modding Doom when it was the BBS, you know, dial up. Yeah. Like somebody you call their house and they got a server. Wow. But, uh, that was that was the fun times actually. It, yeah, it was fun, but it didn't really happen for me till the internet with yeah. Quake because that, that gave me the ability to get out to everyone just by having a, a site where I put maps up or modifications or skins. And yeah, I just got a job out of that. My first first jobs were in 1997 where I shipped uh, two expansions for Quake Damn. for add-ons. And uh, that's me. So we'll just jump right to Brian real quick so he can give it to you. Um, yeah, basically, my story is actually a lot different like um i just i liked drawing all through high school i, I so it's the same <laughs> yeah well that part's the same yes <laughs> very true <laughs> um and then i i really liked um, microsoft paint in high school and I, I didn't know what photoshop was at the time um no excuse for that do you guys ever have mario paint yeah dude, dude i destroyed mario paint. <laughs> i would put all the songs in there and draw everything <laughs> my everything uh, my uh my nintendo broke as a kid so um, Super Nintendo. Yeah, my Super Nintendo. Sorry, my Super Nintendo broke as a kid. I, so did I you even have a Nintendo? Or were you too young? He's too old for that. Um, I actually we, I can't remember. Uh, I had a regular NES, and then that broke the day we bought it. And nobody then, had a Master System. <laughs> the Master System. I, I keep I forgetting remember, what that is. You guys keep mentioning. It I remember to going to a place that had a Master System, and I thought it was the coolest thing. And I'm like, why don't I not know about this? Because they had the Ghostbusters game on there. And it was like, I mean, the Master System was like the, the Sega, Sega Genesis it was Sega NES. NES. Oh, okay. And nobody had one. <laughs> well, wasn't the Genesis called like the Master Drive or Master System? The two Master or Drive was, I think, what they called it in Japan. Like yeah, Famicom. that was. Yeah, it was so weird. They called it different names. Like Famicom would have been yeah. awesome for Super Nintendo. Family Computer. Is that what it stood for? Mm -hmm. Well, that's terrible. That makes no sense. Jaleco stood for Japanese Leisure Company. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but anyway, you're... Yeah. Um, I, liked, I liked Microsoft Paint, and so I got into pixel art for a while. And um, I even got into into shopping up photos in Microsoft Paint. I'm sa it's sad I didn't He was know making his penis was. larger, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. So did you draw before then? Oh, like uh, the yeah. Sketch? I, I, oh, I used to do doodles, and doodles yeah. and all sorts yeah. of crazy stuff. For those of you that don't know, uh, Brian is an animator. Um, and not just one of them 3D animators that makes the characters jiggle around. <laughs> he can also do the drawing stuff where, you know, the things do. Yeah, I used to I used to make little flip books in my um, this. in my textbooks in high school and stuff too. Yeah, so all the little ones were the stick figures. He doesn't died. just apply noise. Yeah, you you <laughs> remind me a lot. Like sometimes your mannerisms remind me a lot of like one of my best friends from home. It's it's really interesting. But like he used to do that. Like he had this awesome like flip books he would make. You know that you would just like it'd always be like some guy and like one guy would pull out a little gun and the next guy would pull out a bazooka and just destroy the yeah, other guy. Yeah, we've done that like, one. Yeah, something Definitely. like yes. that. Yeah, those are awesome. Yeah. Get your little uh, post-it notes and yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty much my story. After that, I went to uh, I went to college and worked really hard during college. Um, I was really surprised by the lack of dedication from other students. Yeah. Because. Um, Art schools will accept anyone, and the reason why they accept anyone is because because they accept money. <laughs> is because they accept money, and you can't you can't technically judge what art is. I mean, art is subjective. I'm good. People exactly. don't understand me. I have exactly. to explain my art to everyone for them to understand. It. See, that's that's the problem, though. Like, I think like art is subjectional. Is that the right term? Subjective. Subjective. It's subjective, right? You know, like, but at the same time, there's artists that do art for a living and artists that don't they try to do art and well there's um you know so there's I think basically it, there's a certain if you're a professional artist yeah what you have to do is adapt yeah you have to be able to say I'm going to join this project that is in this particular art style mm -hmm. and perform in that art style exactly to your best of your ability and if you, and by that I mean you have to do it or you're fired no yeah. I, I mean, it was if, a, it, if if you're like a, an artist that just sells pieces, you can kind of get away with whatever you want. However, it's very very difficult to make enough money to actually make a living. Yeah. Where you're like a guy who just paints some random stuff that ends up in a gallery that's, or or at a, a bar or somewhere that's on the wall, and it's pretty expensive. And it's like, wow. When as a professional artist, I look at that and go, dang, I should just crap something out and put it on a wall for five hundred bucks. Yeah. But. 
That's just not really my gimmick. I mean, that was the thing, like, when I was first coming up in music or starting to learn how to record music was, you know, when I was in high school and I thought I was, I wanted to be the next BC boy, so me and, like, my other friends. You used to drop the rhymes, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I did. I used to Isn't rap. Isn't there a video of that? There, well, there's, there's actually, like, there's a, a track. There's several songs laying around and, uh, you know, I thought those got lost. They were one of those things that, like, I kind of, in a way, I'm like, I wish I could hear that again. But there's some songs that I definitely want to hear again, but there's a lot oh, that sure. I'm, I'm really well, glad. you're talking about stuff that's, like, got lost. How, how old are you talking about, like, six, eight years old? No, we're talking more, like... Two, well, last week. Let's see, I'm 20... Last week, I'm, Charles Brunger dropped a rap album, and he's... No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm 29, and we're making these things when I was, like... 15, 16. 15, 16. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you're over a deck. You're talking about... It's a good 13, 14 you do? If you're doing stuff when you're 15, 16, don't worry about that. That We're all having... No, I know, but I mean, the funny thing is... It's deal. If, if one like, of my friends has a CD of, like, 10 of the songs, and... He has it somewhere safe. Yeah, if you could, if you could post that, that would be so funny for he, you. He's been dying to, but it's kind of embarrassing. I mean, I'm like <laughs> rapping. Like I said, like I said yeah, I'm rapping. 15, you know? 16, don't worry about it. Like yeah. I, I thought I'd be I like. I YouTubed up. Uh, I recently YouTubed up uh, here in my channel, Doctor Squats and Milk. If you can spell it, good for you. I uh, uploaded a, a uh, foot bagging or hacky sack to all you lame persons. It's uh, just a video from me and my buddies out here in Wash Park in 2005. Yeah. That's six years old. But I can't physically do that anymore. Yeah. I was at my prime. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it was it was interesting. But, I mean, like, at the time, I think we thought we're the greatest thing ever. And I think we actually thought that... You could have been. We had a chance you, you to be, like, chance. the next Beastie Boys. But the problem is, is, like, I mean, it's crazy because then you see these kids these days that are, like the same age as you actually making songs that could be hits like i've seen a 16 year old kid making like hit after hit after hit and i'm like holy shit like i thought i was the best thing then but i mean that's the thing is you kind of look back on yourself and it's tough because it's subjective and you think your stuff is the best and then yeah. you know you kind of i guess grow up and realize well Maybe yeah. it's not the best, but there's this process that happens of like learning and adapting and well, learning once you've to learned, work in the like Once you've learned to do something really well, mm -hmm. this is, this is a, a, a very kind of accepted practice or idea, I guess, philosophy, if you will. Once you've learned to excel in one thing really well, you have an understanding yeah. as to how, how what, what something is actually good, when something actually becomes good, yeah. and how you need to reach that process like you understand that the first few times you do something boy it's gonna be stupid yeah it's gonna suck it's gonna be terrible you have to get through that yeah and once you've uh pushed yourself through that process and made it at, at a high level of anything then you can use that same experience that same formula 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 in anything else and not be just retarded <laughs> It's like, oh, I'm great at this. I'm good at guitar now. And you're like, uh, wait, 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 wait. No, you wouldn't do that to people. You wouldn't. Yeah. You would know better. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in music, there are some people that don't know better. I mean, there's this artist <laughs> uh, that will, you know, call me all the time. And, like, I, like it's kind of weird because... Well, they, he played that me person as, particularly excel at first, though. Well, he... I, Does he I make money? No, I mean, what does he need or make money? Make does he make money? No, of course not. But well, there I mean, you go. So that's what I'm talking about. You get every once you've reached a high level. Yeah, that's true. But it was one of those things where I'm like, you know, I remember him playing me this stuff, and I'm like, shit. Like I'm looking around, like, at the studio at Raphael's studio, and like I invited uh, you him guys, over. I... The, I'm looking around, like, is there a hidden camera somewhere? Is this like some kind of Ash joke? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, is this some kind of joke? Like, I mean, I feel bad saying that, but it's kind of like. You do. There are people you see that it's just they have no clear understanding, and they're so on the opposite side of like there's nothing they're doing That's that right. would actually be right or work, or like you just see it and it'd almost be like scribbles on a page. Yeah, and they well, think we, we like, get that. like they're the there's greatest. There's so many thing. people that are like, check out my portfolio, yeah. tell me what I gotta do, and you're like, uh, 
you don't even know where to start. Yeah, much. it's like you're. Just, it's so not. Where it's it depressing needs to be in a way. That but it is very depressing. It's like how did you get to this point? Yeah. So incorrectly, like who? It's de- it's depressing, but they did you, who did you surround yourself with? Yeah. That has held you back so hard by giving you this information. Or at the same time, who did you surround yourself with that actually told you that this might be a good idea to pursue? Oh sure. Yeah. And it, it's a messed up comment, but at the same time, it's like. You oh, know, yeah, I knew a guy that used to tell me all day. Yeah. He's like, I want to be an artist. I want to make art. And then he'd tell me all day how, well, my dad knows I work hard. My girlfriend will tell you I'm dedicated. Well, well yeah, that's because they love you. They yeah. just want to support you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they're not other professionals that can give you the right advice. Well, it's tough. Yeah, it's, I mean, I it's think... It's good that... You, no, don't, don't get me wrong. It's great if your parents support you and your people around you support you, but... You can't use them as a reference. It doesn't work. Yeah. Well, I got like, you know, I think my goal when I moved down to L.A. was, oh, I'm going to be a big time music producer and I'm going to write songs and make hit songs and this or that. But I actually had someone sit me down and basically break it to me, you know, but like, and it was something that was very constructive because they weren't like negative being like, you're never going to make it. You're terrible. And they they, sat gave, me they just down. gave you the proper business. Well, they, yeah, they sat me down and said, "Look, this like, is how it really is. Yeah, this isn't your area, and you know, doing producing and songwriting isn't really your area right now. Look how many people there are doing it here that are better yeah. than you." But when there's a when there's a level of people that's so high, yeah, and there then you have this competition level that's even higher than them. There's this huge group of people that are so much better than you. That would be a, a much better hire. Yeah. That it's worth understanding where you're best at so that you can get up, so you can raise yourself with what you're good at mm-hmm. and then possibly expand into that area you want to get to. You know, who knows how many years, but you got to fit in where you can, you know, get in where you fit in. Exactly. And also those, those people above you, you need to take as inspiration. Most people don't look at them as, as inspiration. They look at them as, oh, I'll never Not be as that good. good. As, or yeah, I'll never be that good, so I'm just going to give up. And it, it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, and that, that was another good analogy that guy told me, too, was like some people, like he would explain a piano, right? And all the people behind making a record with a piano. And, you know, there's some guy that will carry the piano and set the piano up. There's a guy that will play the piano, a guy that will tune the piano, a guy that will record the piano, and a guy that will help write the song for the piano. But he's kind of like, yeah. which person are you? There's all these different elements, and you're still someone. Everyone is just as important. Yeah. But there's there you know there might be a star. Yeah, maybe you're a terrible artist, but you're very good at like, you know, yeah. doing things like. Helping people see the full potential yeah, of look at look at like the a, color there's so many and, and, and you know all these people that have music written for them. Yeah. But even the farthest the farthest extreme was like a Millie Vanilli where they weren't even singing it. Yeah, but there, there's people that they're they're great at writing. Yeah, and they might write a song for somebody for a mate. Like you put an artist that's like a a beautiful woman. You take you take a woman that's like oh god she's super hot and she's young. But, and she can sing just enough, but she can also, you know, dance. She's an entertainer. She's a performer. Yeah. But she needs a good song written for her. Yeah. And yeah. There, there's a spot There's a spot for everybody that necessarily isn't a star, but you can still make a good enough living to be extremely happy. Yeah, I mean, you look at you look at Linda Perry in a way, and she wrote, you know, she was the lead singer of Four Not Blondes, but they were like this one-hit wonder group but then she went on to being one of the biggest writers ever, mm-hmm. you know, like writes all the hit songs and pop songs and rock songs and all kinds of songs. And she's made a bit way better living writing other people's stuff than yeah. for her own. And I mean, she had success on her own, but there's other artists too, other writers too, that there's other people that I've always told, like, it's always tough because everyone wants you know, a lot of people get into music because they want to be the star and want to be on camera, and that's the biggest thing I tell people with music. If is, you don't have the charisma for that, yeah, good luck. Well, it's not even the charisma factor. It's just like I, I told a really close friend of mine, like, you know, why don't you focus on writing? Because no matter what, 
you know like you could you can write songs and if someone has a talent for it yeah you tell them this is what they're good at yeah maybe you're not the person to perform it in front of people which accentuate the positive yeah right? I think she could be still but at the same time you write a hit song for someone else and then people are gonna want more of you yeah. and you write more like and more how much, songs uh, and then how it's much your money did a Dolly Parton make off that Bodyguard soundtrack because she wrote yeah. That one song that was the main song off of that. Oh, yeah. The Whitney Some, Houston one? Yeah, the one that Whitney Houston yeah. sung. But it's. She was the original writer, so she made tons of money off of that. Uh, and it eventually created Dollywood. Now, that was way before. <laughs> that was way before that. but uh, Dollywood. But yeah, you just. Yeah, accentuate the positives, hide the negatives, do what you do best. and Exactly. If you can find that, like, you know. Those. Yeah, you know, and you look at a lot of. A lot of people, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of attorneys or business development people or, you know, producers that are on the publishing side of things and they, you know, their main goal might have been being an artist, but that wasn't, at the end of the day, there were so many artists better than them. But one thing they did understand is, well, I have this like, you know, like, I can't be an artist in the game industry, but I do have this drive for, like, the business side of things. Oh, so yeah, 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 love let me it. jump in and do that, you yeah. know? And maybe they gave up. I mean, in a way, it's kind of like you're not giving up on your dream. Look, it's not It's not that, um, yeah, like you said, you're not giving up on it. It's not that you're giving up on video games. It's, as long as you can find your spot in it. If yeah. you're a cool guy, people like you, you're very knowledgeable about it, you might have a good spot. Yeah. I mean, there's so many places in games for people that are like uh, recruiters like I've known recruiters my whole life and I know these guys like, I don't want to you know, throw anybody under the bus or name any names or anything like that but there's people that I've known that have been around a long time as recruiters that ended up getting jobs at major studios like, and now they're like they've got a spot like back in the days maybe you didn't have a spot managing artists but now it's it's got a place yeah definitely and, like you don't have to you don't have to succumb to a particular activity if it's not working out for you you know if you love it that's fine but maybe that niche of the industry isn't for you yeah but if you can find a way into it accept it yeah. and go with it and maybe the time's not right for you to be what you want to be but it could be down the road because yeah, I mean, now you're in it. Yeah. Because now you've got a job. Now you've got a spot. Now you've figured it out. Now you can be around, You can be surrounded all day by the people that you want to be in that position. You can get all the help you need. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, and that was the thing. Like producing music for me was one of those things where I always wanted to do it, and you know, I realized that I wasn't as good as anyone else. But I did realize that, you know, some that guy told me that you know, hey, go down this engineering route and you might be a producer someday if that's what you really want to be. But right now, you can't really be a producer and songwriter. And, you know, I started latching on to people like, okay, Rick Rubin, you know, like Rick Rubin doesn't necessarily like play, you know, every instrument or or like write songs fully by himself. But he's one of those dudes that can pick the right people and pair the right people up and, you know, sit there and make sure that a song isn't fucked up. And he brings the full potential out of people and that's what good producers do you know there's this whole notion of like things being a lot different than they are these days and I think that's what was cool is it eventually came around to where I followed that path because I saw the talent that I had and I'm like okay I could kind of bring it back and you know it ended up working out and it was cool it was a cool experience but and I never really would have guessed that I would have gotten there in a way so yeah it's the thing like Maybe certain people's jobs aren't being artists, but they can yeah. get into art you through don't, other channels. The point is, you don't have to necessarily do exactly what you think is the path to get where you need to be. I mean, shit. There's, 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 there's so many positions in the entertainment industry to yeah. work your way into and have a place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you might, at some point in time, there might be a... You know, and someone that's your art lead or art director that doesn't know as much art as you or can't draw, but he's able to like bring the best out of you, and that's what's 
yeah. good in those positions. Accentuate the positives. Exactly. Everybody. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so is there anything in particular uh, you'd like to promote here? Because we, we should probably wrap it up here pretty soon. Yeah. So um, besides, so you, right now, you know, you got Ilphonic. Ilphonic.com. Ilphonic.com. Ghettogolf.com.org.net. Do you have all those? No, but <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd promote it. Is, is, is uh, Ghettogolf.com, oh, is that, is it? It open? actually forwards to Ilphonic. It is a forwards Ilphonic. Yeah, so. We can find information about Ghetto Golf, and Ghetto Golf isn't even really uh, what we're working on right now. We're, yeah, we're Nexus, working on Nexus. Nexus.com. We just spelled N E X. U wait I U Z N E X I No N E X U I Z U I Z N E X U I Z Look I've been working on this for what is it uh, a year over I've been working on this for nineteen months and can't even spell the damn name. So it's the, cool. Every email from our publisher comes back as a different it's name a, or spelling or whatever. In the, in, in so the E3 really video matter. from Machinima, yeah. they spelled the game wrong. I know. It's <laughs> terrible. It's like, oh. So it's uh, N-E-X-U-I-Z yeah. dot com. You can find it from Ilphonic dot com. Good luck spelling that. I-L-L-F-O-N-I-C. We'll put all these links in the description of the video. It'll be great. So anyway, you do that. You do that. If you you want to follow us on Twitter, you got Ilf, at Ilphonic. Yep. Um, do you have a Twitter account or anything? You, uh, you just, pretty much Twitter at Ilphonic. So it gets kind of odd sometimes. Well, it's pretty. It's not necessarily a personal account, more as a business account. Yeah. And that's fine. But you can kind of you can send a message, and it might get that way. But you know, you can find him on Facebook, uh, and you can. Follow old Brian over there. He's also working on the same game, so it's nothing. He has nothing to promote, but uh, his name, which is up here anyway. Yeah. yeah there he is. Here's Brian. Follow you. I still. Follow I still only have two followers. Two followers. One is me, and the uh, other is who's the other? My mom. <laughs> really? My mom, yeah. mom's on Twitter. Yeah. She's got more followers, right? I'm. I'm pretty like sure 19 she does. Nineteen at least. Yeah. I'm just guessing. Well, shit. I didn't know you had a Twitter. You could count that as one okay. more. Okay, well, awesome. well, Brian just made I just it. signed up. He just like, signed up, yeah. and he hasn't really, like, he doesn't aggregate himself in any way in any communities at all. I think I, I think I have, like, ten tweets now. They're pretty, oh, okay. I think they're pretty funny. I heard you hit a milestone recently. Which one? With Facebook. On Facebook? What did I do? You, you signed, you signed up. up. Oh, I signed up. <laughs> yeah, I hit a milestone of signing up. I don't know if I was supposed to be quiet about that. Like, if there's no, an NDA. No, no, it's cool. Discussing there's an NDA. An NDA in Facebook. place that you can't talk no, about. No, pretty much, I, I, I decided to sign up on Facebook just because I knew so many game developers that are also there, and I wanted to help keep in touch with all those pals. And it's been working out great. I got a few guys immediately. Like, hey, what's up? Because LinkedIn's just not good enough. Yeah, LinkedIn's cool, but you know. It's like post your resume and forget. Yeah, exactly. It's not something you go in there I and I think I got chat. like 36 connections on there. Yeah. Oh, I've got like hundreds. Google yeah. Plus. Like me and my buddy uh, John Jones. Google Plus. Not the UFC fighter. He's a outsourcing manager and artist. Uh, we used, we Back in the old days when LinkedIn first showed up, we had like a, a LinkedIn fight to get more uh, connections. Yeah. And I forgot where we stopped, but we... We're we're both somewhere in the several hundreds. It's, it's stupid. Yeah. We're just we're just hitting anybody. But yeah, I just signed up on Facebook and that's great. You can find me on there if you like. I've already had. I've actually because of this podcast, I had people hit me up on that. I've had a few new uh, a few new Twitter followers, a few new uh, YouTube subscribers, and uh, a few new uh, people on Facebook. It's it's interesting. Yep. It's interesting the way this whole thing works out. That, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing is to, to help you know get the information out, let people know about who we are, get us get us going. Let's make it happen. Yeah, exactly. One million <coughs> hits for every website on the internet. <laughs> but yeah, check us out. And um, thank you to Chuck for coming out here tonight. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We had a great time. Had a good time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. We'll talk to you folks next time. We don't know. Uh, this was actually an early one. We did it on Monday instead of Wednesday. Uh, the next one probably be next Wednesday, but uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, we all have a bunch of stuff going on. Brian? Yeah. Are you going to fly out? Is it going to happen? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go. Uh, the question is whether or not it'll launch, but I'm going yeah. to Florida to see the, the last government-sponsored uh, shuttle launch. Yeah, from NASA. So. The big, what is, 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 is it, what is this? 
what, what, what what's you, the name of this ship? Do you remember the oh, name of the ship? Oh, I have no idea. I don't know uh, anything geez. about it. Discovery. It was yeah. <laughs> or did I'm that not. one blow up? <laughs> that was that was the Challenger. Oh yeah. Back in the eighties, the Challenger exploded. What was the recent one that broke that, up on oh, yeah. Reactor? Just like a, it was when I was in high school, so just oh yeah, yeah, yeah. just a couple years ago. Too soon. I don't even remember. Too soon. It was too soon. I apologize. I don't remember. But I do love space exploration and technology. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. But anyway, yeah, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks to Chuck. Thanks to Brian. Thank you, guys. Thanks to you. Get us some views. (laughs) And this is where we do the whole outro part.